Welcome to Fast Talk Laboratories, your source for the science of endurance performance. Hey everyone, welcome to Fast Talk YouTube edition. I'm Chris Case, Trevor Connor is sitting beside me here. We just exited the podcast studio. We wanted to give you a recap of what we discussed at length in that studio. Today we're talking about a study and a, and a complimentary study, if you will, on zone two. Trevor, you were so giddy in the podcast studio that your shirt came unbuttoned and you were, <laughs> you were overheating a little bit. You've buttoned up now. Um, this particular study, Much Ado About Zone 2, is the brief title of it. It has been everywhere. Zone 2 is mentioned in so many places these days, um, not just in training science, but in uh, podcasts about longevity and, and general health. Tell us a little bit more about why this study makes a good point and then maybe gets a little off track. Yeah, it's a study that's been getting a lot of traction, it's, it's particularly on social media, because it is a study that is challenging what's really popular right now. Uh, and so you're getting people on both camps really getting into this conversation, which makes it important. So I was really excited to read it and, and hear what it has to say. And its primary message is that we've gone overboard with zone two, mm -hmm. that you are seeing a lot of influencers, a lot of people saying for our health, for our fitness, we should be doing all zone two training, forget about intensity. And zone two, for anybody who's hearing this for the first time, it's lower intensity. It's that, you know, if you were a runner you know, be kind of that fast walking pace, slow jog type pace. Mm -hmm. You're not really killing yourself. And I think it's main argument that in unfit or just not elite athlete type individuals, we have gone too far um, with zone two and that intensity is important. And then there's a lot of evidence showing that intensity is essential for both improving our health and actually for improving our, our uh, aerobic fitness. And I think they make a good point there. I have no argument with that. Where do they go wrong, do you think? I think they take that argument and then take it to such an extreme on the other side mm -hmm. that they start making the same mistake that they're arguing against. Mm. Um, they're making the point that there's this belief that zone two is great for us, but there just isn't a, a ton of science to back this. And, the, you know, and they do very legitimately make the point there's a lot of evidence for high-intensity training. But there is a giant difference between saying there is no research on something and saying the evidence is against this thing. When yes. there is no research, you don't know. That's all you can say. And as you go through the paper, they go from something that I really agreed with to going to that other extreme of saying, you know what? We really see all the adaptations in high-intensity training, and the evidence is against, and they literally state this, that the, the bulk of the evidence is against any benefits of zone two training. Mm -hmm and start to make the argument that the gains are in high intensity, why would you bother doing zone two? And I think they're making the same mistake that they're arguing against just on the other side. Yeah. Um, and even in their conclusions, they start by making that statement saying, the bulk of the evidence is against any benefits to zone two. And then actually, I, I don't know if, if they're aware of this, counter their own argument where they start saying, yeah, but there's no research on zone two. Mm-hmm these studies haven't been done on zone two. So all they can say is we don't have the evidence for zone two, but we also don't have the evidence against zone two. Yeah. I think one of the other issues with the article is that while they start out and in the title of the article, it talks about the general population, they drift a little bit within the article and start talking about zone two in various ways, which don't necessarily agree with what you would define 
zone two if you are in more of a exercise physiology context and that leads to some issues and um, the conclusions they draw from that are therefore maybe not as as uh, beneficial as you otherwise would be yeah. is that correct yeah. My old advisor used to like to say the devil's in the details. And I think with this review, you really have to look at the details. And when you get there, there are some major issues here. And with zone two, you know, again, they're talking about general population, but as you get into the study, they're really just talking about zone two in general and, and don't differentiate that much between elite and the general population. But they start at the beginning and have a correct definition of zone two, which is just below... Uh, LT1, um, so that's lactate threshold one, which is which is fairly low intensity. But then they get very inconsistent about their definition of zone two, and I had to kind of go through it twice to find how what what sort of intensities they're defining as zone two. And I don't think anybody would agree with with where they put it. So at one point at the very end, and it's it's easy to miss, they define zone two as as less than forty five percent of VO two max. Yeah. And I, if I went out for a walk, I think I'd be over 45% <laughs> of VO2 max. Right. In the literature, what is more often seen? There's huge individual variation. You're going to have a lot of people define it very differently, but I'm going to say if you wanted somewhere in a broad consensus, when you're talking about an unfit population, zone two is somewhere around 60, 65%. Okay. When you're talking about elite, it can be as high as 80% of VO2 max. So we're talking much higher. And there, this is important because many times through the review when they are making the case against zone two, um, they talk about studies where people were exercising at 60% of VO2 max and they say that's above zone two, where mm -hmm. I would actually say that's either below zone two or at the low end. Yes. And then more importantly, they cite some other studies when they're talking about high intensity exercise. They cite some other studies where people are exercising at 65, 70, 75 percent of VO2 max and seeing benefits. And they're citing those as examples of why high intensity <laughs> exercise is better. And I look at that and go, no, that's back in zone two. That's the heart of the zone two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you can have some debate on that, but I think when you are defining zone two as less than 45%, you're not going to get any physiologist who's, who's going to back you on that. Just as importantly, you have to look at duration. Mm -hmm. How long is the activity? Um, physiologists resolved this a long time ago that benefits of zone two takes time particularly when you're talking about the sports population, like you have to be going out for a four or five hour ride or a two, three hour run. Um, and a lot of this research that they're citing that shows no benefit of zone two, several of them literally, they were doing 30 minutes. Yeah. And doing 30 minutes below 60%, which is a recovery workout at best. It's not training. Um, I saw almost nothing that was over 90 minutes. And to me, again, that is a mistake if you're trying to make a statement about the benefits for or against uh, of zone two training. It seems like this particular article has some significant flaws in terms of the methodology here, but are there some conclusions we can draw that are helpful for athletes? Yeah, I think... Where they start is a really good message, which is we have to be careful about just accepting dogma and going with it. And we have to be really careful about taking anything to an extreme. I agree. If there are people out there that are saying zone two is miraculous, don't do zone two all the time, and you're going to have huge gains in your fitness, you're going to have the best health, I think they're misleading you. And I'm glad this paper came out to challenge them and say, look, you've gone too far. Um, and certainly ACSM, their recommendations for general population um, to stay healthy and fit has a lot of intensity. And I don't disagree with that at all. We need intensity. There's proven benefits to it. Um, but I think it, it is a balanced thing. And you can't go the other way as well. And this is a, a mistake that we saw 15, 20 years ago in the science where, again, devil is in the details. 
most of our research is on high intensity because it is very hard to study zone two training, particularly when you're getting into longer workouts. So there has been a bias in the lab to studying high intensity. So yes, absolutely. There is a ton of research showing the benefits of high intensity. There's very little research showing pros or cons of zone two training. Mm-hmm. All that tells you is, yes, we know there's benefits to high intensity. We don't know about zone two. But from experience, we are seeing people get a lot of gains from zone two. So until that research is done, experience shows us it's probably something that's worth doing, but we should be doing both. Yeah. And that speaks to an episode that you did recently about the dialogue between coaches and researchers sometimes doesn't Uh, It's not a fruitful conversation because uh, researchers might dismiss coaches and vice versa, but the two of them benefit if they talk to each other. Is that, is that, do I have that right? We're going to get a lot further if coaches and researchers are working together. And certainly 20 years ago, you really saw them in different camps. And I can tell you reading the research, you saw the complete lack of experience of some researchers who were doing tests on athletes to provide information about the most effective training where you just look at it and go, nobody would ever do that. This is actually useless research, even though you found some results, because you just fundamentally don't understand how people train. And so there needs to be that conversation between coach and researchers, and coaches also need to respect the research. I think any coach who just goes, I'm doing this all by experience. I don't care what the science says. I think they're making just as big a mistake. But, and sorry, uh, you know, I, again, I support what they are trying to do with this study. I think there's some good things in it. But I did see an interview with the lead author where when experience was brought up, her response was, show me the research. Mm-hmm. Dismissive. It was kind of dismissive and going, basically saying, if there isn't research, it isn't real. So there, why would you do zone two? We don't have research on that. And when you are talking with a coach who has worked with Olympic athletes, who has worked with Tour de France cyclists and seen huge value in zone two, and you're dismissing them because you're saying, show me the research, Yeah. which the research hasn't been done. That's a flaw <laughs> in the research, not a flaw in the coach. Yeah, yeah. That's where I, I get on board with the coach saying, you know what? You're not listening to me. And uh, I don't know how many more conversations I want to have with you. Mm, mm -hmm. So I think coaches need to be humble and say, let's listen to the researchers, despite my experience. But researchers need to be humble. And this is where I'm going to quote Dr. Seiler said, there is a lot more that we don't know about physiology than we do know about physiology. And researchers have to, to accept the fact that coaches have experience that hasn't been proved in the lab. And they have to trust some of that experience. Mm. Well, that's really the tip of the iceberg of what we talked about in the podcast, which we dove into much more of the biochemistry, a much deeper dive on some of these topics, introduced another paper, which ironically has some of the same authors, but was much more nuanced. So check that out on our podcast channel.